The more time I spend thinking about the Falkenhagen bunker, the more I can't help but ask, why? Why is this here? Why was this built at all? Every chemical production facility at the time was above ground. IG Farben's was above ground. It was not until 1943-44 with Allied bombing that synthetic oil facilities began moving into caves and tunnels. So why, in 1938, would you start building the biggest bunker in Europe for a chemical production facility? I don't understand the logic. We are returning to the deep of the bunker today to look closer at the parts we now know what were, especially the third floor and the fire suppressing. We'll also visit the sarin plant after that, and then I will try to tie it together. I do encourage you to watch the first episode from here, as there are a lot of moving parts you might otherwise miss. The Falkenhagen bunker was the largest constructed in Europe by far. It was, or is, gigantic, underground, an end stuff factory. The plant was planned and conceptualized in 1938 and would cost a hundred million Reichmark. The Seren plant, operated by the SS, next to it would cost 60 million Reichmark. On average, there was never more than 2,000 people working on the construction site, including production and technician staff. It was initially constructed by the German Army's research department, Heerenswaffesamt, under Erich Schumann, with whom you are all by now well acquainted. Eventually, IG Farben, under Otto Ambros, would move in and slowly push the army out, and under the direction of Hitler and Speer. However, the SS thereafter began to push them out, and side by side would build a sarin plant. Also, Hitler ordered the SS to take over testing of the end stuff, one of the most volatile compounds ever developed. Why? It was expected that end stuff had applications as a rocket fuel or as an explosive. Today, we use it for uranium enrichment and I am wondering if Kurt Diebner, Schumann's partner in the SS think tank under Rolf Engel, or the Kammlerstab at the Skoderwerk in Pilsen, had begun to eye and stuff for some other special application. Since Himmler went to great lengths to take over the facility, and Schumann the same to ensure it continued to produce. But we'll get back to that later. The German Navy experimented with torpedoes with a filling of only 20 grams of end stuff, as well as regular explosives, resulting in huge fires in even protected fuel areas of tankers. However, there were difficulties, and the Navy did not feel they could overcome these. The German army was hoping for a new version of Greek fire, however appeared to have problems harnessing it at the Army Weapons Office, had originally developed a whole catalogue of possible military uses for end stuff, which was of interest to all three branches of the Wehrmacht, the Army, the Luftwaffe. All developments were based on two basic areas of application. End stuff could be used as a fire or destructive agent, or as a fuel additive for much energy-rich combustion reaction. However, with increasing research, it turned out to be extremely difficult to tame the reactive product for any use in practical terms. The Enstoff facility, under the direction of Dr. Siegfried Glube, he was originally also from the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, from where he knew Diebner. In 1944, SS Obergruppenführer Schwab received permission to experiment with Enstoff on five prisoners previously sentenced to death at Sachsenhausen. Since it were being passed over by the Army, the Air Force, Navy, as possible use in its bombs, SS Gruppenführer Schwab also did not allow himself to be deterred by the negative result of Enstoff. His next research question was to investigate the toxicity of this chemical in more detail, specifically on humans. Schwab turned to the Reichsarzt SS and police 
Ernst Robert Gravitsch, who in turn obtained the appropriate permission from Himmler. They wanted to determine the physiological effect of end stuff on and through the human skin. It states in Gravitsch's letter to Himmler. Himmler gave his consent for the experiments. However, no documents have survived about the experiments themselves. But since chlorine trifluoride, the chemical name for end stuff, is very reactive, especially with organic compounds, the process must have been cruel enough for the test subjects. Schwab's seal, with which he also devoted himself to these secondary questions of usage for end stuff, certainly had its origins in the conflict over who to run Falkenhagen, which could only be resolved in the favor of the SS, if some application for this substance was finally found. However, he later decided to relocate the entire facility to Stollen in Bavaria. It was later described by Professors Benecke and Schmaltz that despite their best efforts to learn what the new applications were that Schwab supposedly found, they knew nothing about them. What Schwab himself apparently had stated and written were strange ancient references with no means of feasibility and could only be described as crazy according to them, leaving me quite curious as to exactly what was it Schwab he found and what did he write. Dr. Klube and Kuberfuhr Schwab did not see eye to eye, and Kuberfuhr Dr. Karl Brandt from Himmler's office tried to facilitate a smooth coexistence. They were still arguing the areas of responsibility between IG and the SS in January 45. Glube would write, difficulties have currently arisen in Falkenhagen because the SS is already operating in end stuff substance production here and is extensively occupying the workshops, the general production facilities, and now also wants the bunker and machines. As a result, the expansion of the sarin production suffers. Since sarin is a highly effective weapon, the accelerated development of which can be decisive in the war the SS intervention in the Falkenhagen must be strongly objected to. I find it extremely strange that IG and the SS were almost adversaries here. They have a deep and tangled working relationship everywhere else in the Reich. But by January 1945, the front was only 20 kilometers away, and talks of expansion was now pointless. And the operation manager, von Kleck, began thinking of relocating the equipment. After the war, Kleck stated, one of the last letters that reached us at Sivek came from Ambrose and contained the orders to destroy all secret files. In this letter, he made me responsible for carrying out the order. The files were then destroyed with the greatest care, and I believe I can say with absolute certainty that there are no secret files left there. However, what files did Glube hand over to the American unit who arrived there before the Russians, and who were they exactly? The first CIA mention of this large bunker system was in 1950. One of the Polish prisoners testified after the war that he was put on a work detail that had been tasked to transport a load of silver and platinum plates, about 120 centimeters long and wide, and sunk them into a small lake two to three kilometers away. The remaining 500 prisoners or so were evacuated to Buchenwald. From February 1945, evacuation of end stuff and machinery were to begin. 60 wagons would leave the area, a second train was planned to be moved to a second location, and five tank trucks left towards Stullen, but one went on to Prague. Why? Train wagons full of ship mines were later discovered on the train station at Briesen, intended for the destruction of the Falkenhagen facility. But no destruction was ever done, leaving questions when we get to the Sarin plant part. By March, the facility was emptying. The Wehrmacht troops were using it for staging area and operated a field hospital there as the front kept moving closer. On 7 and 8 April, the last soldiers and staff departed Falkenhagen. No contact with the Russians was made, and the Russians had been notified not to bomb or shell the factory. The Red Army moved in on April 15, 1945. During the advance, Soviet soldiers were strictly forbidden from firing at the factory, 
as a Russian artilleryman reported to a former concentration camp prisoner after the war, because the Soviet army was not aware what chemicals were stored at the Falkenhagen factory, but they were aware there was something there. After the war on October 30, 1945, the Russians begins to dismantle and remove the remaining machinery, including rail tracks. German forced labors were used for this. Heating and water supply was kept in use as the Red Army used the sites for troops stationed there. From 1954 to 59, Falkenhagen was used for vehicle storage and repair and temporary quarters for Red Army soldiers. From 1960 and onwards, the site gradually became more and more restricted to locals and the Soviets established a huge command post in the large bunker and more buildings were constructed. So what do we have and how did it operate? Something which also opens up to more questions. So we have a 27 meter tall above ground segment of the bunker with four floors underneath and two half floors and change. There was a rail connection through the bunker's first floor at the time of production. It was built as an open construction with 70 boreholes for drainage. It is lined with copper sheathing for better water resistance. The walls are generally three and a half meters thick. They were reduced on some sides when underground in some areas down to 1.5 meters. It's approximately 156,000 square meters. The ceiling height varies from 6 meters to 2.2 meters, and there's about 400 rooms. Initially, only two ventilation towers were constructed. The third were added in 1942, and serves the third and fourth ground floor. The ventilation towers also contain a water reservoir, possibly for emergency flooding needs. The roof of these towers are 2.5 meters thick. The first floor, walls and floors were tiled entirely for the production of end stuff, which was produced in various stages. Materials would be loaded and unloaded on the rail cars, which would enter the first floor and be parked on a 180 meter long rail. Yeah. This certainly is very green Russian paint. Behind this door. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for down. Where did you go? So this was the production hall for the catalytic synthesis for chlorine fluoride, or end stuff. This is still basically the upper level support part of the building. Now we're coming closer to you. Oh, so we take that one. The floors were all separated by multi-combination doors. The second floor was initially laid out as a hall properly for the process control and yield optimization of the end stuff. Second underground floor. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> we're back to it. The 
floors were raised. There's a lot of attachments that used to be hanging on these ceilings and walls. The Soviets modified the second floor rather extensively into offices, as this is where they had their main command post. So it's somewhat difficult to discern exactly what the end stuff plant here looked like. And I kind of wonder about you have design features like this, and you wonder like what was the point? What was the original point of this? Mm-hmm. It's weird. Unless. There's nothing. What was the point? I mean, what do you what do you put in a place like this? <laughs> nothing on the other end. Like you don't put machinery. What do you do with this? What goes here? I mean, it's just it it's it's just weird. In the funny, cute way. What in the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Just to make it a little bit romantic. That's kind of what I was afraid you were going to say. Uh, do you want to be alone with yourself and your thoughts? I did tell you that military historians were a little strange, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> this was originally an end stuff processing optimization area. This is just such an interesting room, even, you know, uh, without the candles. I'm so sorry. And let's enjoy the most romantic a Cold War nuclear war command post will ever be. I mean, this is part of the original construction. This must have been part of the original construction. Of course, the steel frame is post-war the Russian setup for their command center. And remember, at the time of the Enstuff plant, heating was a crucial part of the production. Every room and machinery had to stay at a constant 20 degrees for production reasons and safety. So that is baked in all of the walls and all of the rooms. Intricate details. It's interesting that they raised the floors. There's a lot of ventilation that went through this place. downstairs that's higher for some other reason. I mean, they really put it together. They must have dug down 200 meters and then just mm -hmm. built the rooms up and up and up. Because this is an enormous construction in the middle of the war. Yeah. I mean, the Allies, they could do it away from the Allied air, air, air surveillance to some degree. Oh yeah, this is the dead end too. Why did I say bricks? This must have been a post-war Russian evolution. Straight to Siberia. Uh, is, is your is your dagger counter counting a little faster than before? Just a little bit. Uh, are we going a little faster? I, 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 a little. Yeah. Mm, the, the tiles. We went in an old red factory in Vienna that was built uh, before the war, but the uh, they used a lot of prisoners to make uh, bread for the war effort. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, they also put on the walls, you see fluorescent paint all the way through, and it still works. No, it was interesting, I didn't even detect it, I saw it visually. This is goes to the upstairs. Oh. This is this goes to the upstairs. This is where we were upstairs and looked down. That's where this is. Yes. Or that. Is. So what is this? Oh, and here's another one. Here's a slide. This is where we were upstairs. This is interesting. Interesting that the floor here is rounded. There's an interesting part about this is that the floor here is rounded. See how that rounds up into the staircase comes up there? There's usually three reasons for curvatures like this. One, to support cabling, or facilitate the movement of water or air. But this only goes up to the upstairs, and then, uh, then it goes down into, actually what it looks like, that pipe, maybe. Or it doesn't look like a real glass. No, no, it just looks like an access panel to keep, you know, soldiers out or something. And in the Red Army, soldier-proofing things was of high priority. So they must be liquid, all of it. And down there is where the water, this is the second and a half floor where the water tanks are. Second half floor? Second and a half floor. Where the, you have the big heavy water tanks? Yes, 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 I see this. Yeah. And, and, Do you think this was the elevator? Oh, don't look like an elevator. Uh, not, not now, but could it have been? No, it doesn't, does it? On the roof, be, uh, above the first floor. Ventilation. Yes, it was a ventilation shaft and downwards this hole here. Okay, well that explains why there's Alright, so the mysterious third floor from West, from where we will never be seen again is here. The third floor for condensation and accident suppression has a ventilation shaft that leads up to a tower on the ground. It held some very special features for fire suppression and we assume water was stored on the third floor for emergency flooding. However, in order to flood the bottom floor, the fourth floor, where end stuff would be stored and bottled, 
that would require over 50,000 cubic meters of water. And the third floor would only store about 900 cubic meters of water. So we were warned about the third floor. For some reason, it's hard to find your way out. Of course, if you're seeing this video, we obviously figured it out. But, uh, It's amazing how big this place is. I uh, I don't know where to start, so <laughs> as long as you don't leak when you do it. Sounds of sounds. I, I was just amazed. What's in there? I don't know, but it's uh, a long uh, tunnel. Well, okay. Yeah, that is a long tunnel. And I mean, cable access? I mean, it's a technical. During the time of the Enstuff plant, the third floor played a crucial part in carrying the means to suppress fires or accidents below, and also through here, any blasts from down there would be funneled up through the hallway into the tower we went in the beginning of the last episode. The Russians would use this floor and that tunnel to lay the communications equipment and cables in safety. Lots of ventilation. Russians also reinstalled the ventilation for air conditioning for their own troops. There's a lot of ventilation leading into this room, or that room. I think this is it. Well, I mean, I don't know what it is, so... This is long. This is a very long hallway. <coughs> you have the exit of the mine? Ah, follow the E. Evacuate? I mean, look at this. Wonder what this was. Maybe a temporary desk. To fill it up, just the desk holder. Oh, you mean? Oh, you mean you to? This is cement. This is not even like. Okay, maybe it was. The desk I get, but why the cement? For temporary beds. But you were Well, no. This had something to do with something else. These square things. <laughs> Soviets had used these hallways to quarter their soldiers, so the hinges on the walls was for fold-down beds. That it, it gives me an idea that in the room to the right of us, there's something. And if I'm guessing, to the left of us is a parallel hallway that looks just like this, with another room next to that, but I'm just guessing. I am completely just throwing out there that symmetry usually fits into some of these places. And now I will prove my theory by looking down here at a similar hallway. So I guess the key is what is in here. Ah, come here. Take a look. I knew it was something. I don't know what it is, but I knew it was something. This is the other side. That's strange. That is very strange. So maybe they break the. Is that a ventilation? No. I mean, if there's a. Yeah, was that that ventilation grate could maybe no that no that used to be here. But look, look at those heavy. Okay. That that parallels the hallway. That's kind of what I thought. But look at those heavy mounts on the... I mean, something, a heavy, very heavy lid or something was on there. Something that withstands blast yeah. or pressure. 
And yeah, certainly heavy white, enough to. But white make no sense here. Some kind of white. And this is where it gets interesting. We have always been informed that water was stored here in some quantity, and the hallways are curved to facilitate the rapid movement of either explosive vapor, actual fumes, or the expansion of air, ventilation, or the rapid movement of liquids. However, we also know that with the chlorine trifluoride, there is only one way of dealing with a fire of CIF flooding the fire with nitrogen or a noble gas such as argon. How exactly does that square up with these heavy hinges that looks more as they would facilitate a rapid insertion of water into the floor below? Some automatic glass doors. Well, I guess we're going to have to go in and have a look down. So I guess the next step is this is rounding, this is not a hard form. Since that could be that's got the pipe has to be Russian post-war because that that pipe gets in the way of whatever that that's got to be new so so that's Russian or German the pipe the, the pipe is Russian the pipe is Russian but everything else is German yes. part of the original construction of doing something yeah, because if they were both Russian, then they wouldn't put the pipe over the hinges. So, and there was a lot of cables down here at some point for some reason. And here's another identical hallway. And it has a different color than the other hallway. So all these are parallel rooms, but this has a different color. The other one was green, this is yellow. So... So we don't, we want to, whatever we're doing, we don't want to confuse. So here's a room without any of those things. Ventilation? Yes. Here you see the wood from uh, when they made this. Yeah. So here's just a hallway. Now this is very strange on several levels, as we know that water reacts especially violently with end stuff. Thus, it could not be used as fire suppression, as a trichloride fire would become exponentially worse if it became wet. So whatever the Russians did with it is one thing, but what was it before they got here? Yeah, we came in through there. Here we go again. 
And there's, and yeah, because this is a ventilation that leads into that little middle tunnel, isn't it? This probably leads into this. Oh, yeah. well, uh, here's the little, well, this is the little tunnel, I think. What have we here? All right. Well, that's three. That just makes so much sense to no one. Does it make sense to you? I mean, I think if we go down to the other end of that hole, you can crawl in through space. I think this is the tunnel that leads. Ah, but you know one of us is going in there anyway. Uh, how can you hold this? So I told you about the easy way of doing it. Yes. <laughs> yes, that makes all the difference. What? I guess it's hard on it. I don't know, it sounds like you're not symmetrically built, I don't know. Okay, no handbrake. Ah, wow, this is long. Long! So... <laughs> Longer, I didn't see it in the end. Oh. So if I go down to the other end and shine the light, yes. should I try? That's a nice game. <laughs> Here's nothing, and here... Huge ventilation pipes that are connected to each other here. Clearly, well, those two pipes are connected. There's another one. So, what was this water for on the third floor? What exactly were these drainage tunnels for? It was, at some point, also claimed that the bunker could be flooded in case the Russians came too close, but there's also not nearly enough water stored in order to make that possible. And the noble gases that would be needed to put out a fire and stuff, how would that be funneled through these very large vents on the third floor? It's very easy to get turned around in a place like this. I'd just like to see if these are above the other tunnels or not. That's not what I expected to see. Did not expect a dead end. Okay. So let me go back. What was stored in here? Was there tanks of nitrogen, water, or machinery to pump that through? So, we came from there. there. So, it's the only option, really.
I don't know why people say this was hard to get in and out of. This is the simplest one of all of them. The fourth floor also housed ventilation to keep humidity low. So can we see? I mean, this is the ventilation. So there should be a whole lot of little, small, little vents in. But there was also the bottling yeah. and storage of the end stuff, as well as the bottom of the three large diesel tanks that were stored, covering over three floors. On the third floor, the end stuff was liquefied from an aerosol, and it was then kept in cool containers of pure iron or copper on the fourth floor. There's going to be more than this. This is almost heating, if anything. Here there was also an escape and service staircase leading up to the ground itself. I mean, it just bends a little. So, here's a question. What if all these ventilations are not in order to vent anything out, but to just put fresh air in? Because none of these will fit with, with a glass evacuation. I mean, if there's glass in here, well, it's not going to go out that door, but it's not going to go through that vent to go up. So maybe these, they're really damn heavy duty just to put air in, aren't they? If anything would lead into that tunnel, it would be that thing. Could that be an emergency? That's a hell of a thing. So this has some connection to outside. Well, theoretically, it's oh. it's open. Last door. But well, maybe it's welded. Well, I mean, I, th I think with a crowbar we could open it, but <laughs> but it's a, it's a rather significant piece of metal. This is where the alien is gonna jump out and eat us the moment we open this thing. Voila! <laughs> I, I expected more. I, I really had expected more. I'm a little disappointed, I will say. Um, yes, it is like it is. Yep, it's not this. Is. I don't know, dude. I mean, seriously. <laughs> We usually do better than that when you open things. However, if you remember that hallway where for the main, that can't be it. The hallway out, they cemented on the other side under the uh, water tower. I wonder if that leads there. Because there is another corridor that's supposed to lead outside. Um, 
to where we went in first. Artifacts. You're not going to find a user manual Matches. by chance. We have some smokers here. Mm -hmm. Well, they were Russian. Maybe this was the smokers chamber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I guess in the 1960s everyone was. There's also pipes that ran along the walls under the stairs. That's where we were in. So the roof. This must be the original doors. You think? And uh, Russians or maybe other people have put here a second layer to look at more fancy. Oh. You know what? Yeah, but, but this looks too nice. The Russians have put plywood. Yeah, they put particle board, gray particle board over. That's actually interesting. So that is the original doors. Why so the structure is all the original one. Maybe for a noise cancellation? No, because this is wood and it makes people happy. And we're not allowed happy no, and no, no, no. time. I, I just keep having this recurring thought. You make small batches of a highly flammable and explosive fuel in each one of these rooms. Down here. If anything goes catastrophically wrong, where is that explosion going to go? I know we have all, we, we go upstairs, we have all these ventilation pipes and all this transportation, but here we have these, but where's the, where would the pressure go? Sure. The, I mean, I would, I would want to say that if, if, if the pressure wave in here from, it would kill everybody in here. Yeah, it's heavier than air, I think. Yeah. And then it goes... But I mean, eventually it would make its way up, a, a blast, a blast here? Where would it go? There's no way for a, any kind of explosion. So I don't think they made, did anything here that potentially could explode because this would be suicide. But this is where they would then eventually made, they made the, uh, the end stuff. If explosives go catastrophically wrong, no, you don't have time to run out and close the doors and hide. You're not going to live that long. It's just going to happen. <laughs> so if anything would go wrong with something like this, there's no reaction or time to close doors. It's just going to happen. So I, I just don't see. Plus, I mean, oh, hey, hey, hey. I got something. This is kind of maybe the drone we're looking for, but it's a teeny weeny little hole. It has the right shape. I mean, seriously, though. Right? But look, this, this room is arched, and there's absolutely nothing else in this room. Anything that goes wrong in this room, it's going to go through that door. And so maybe that is for just, it can't be, they can't have these big hinges just for ventilation. That's ridiculous. That hole is not connected to this ventilation pipe. So that is going up to the next floor. See the, the, where this slope is. So, that little hole are the more of those. Yeah. Uh, so, this must be it. Because here's one other one. The, the tunnels up there were no, was no exhaust, it was fresh air from outside all the people. Yeah. When an accident happens, That looks like it's a cement insert, doesn't it? Hmm. Why can't I hear the Geiger counter? Did he get eaten by the alien? 
So these square holes, over which I assume from the cutout there was some sort of a grate, connect up to the third floor where these huge steel hinges were in place. So this was either to flood the room with something, or it was to ventilate a catastrophic event, which it seems very small in order to do. And that dead end is into nowhere. So there's a technical subfloor, but there's no cement. Where does the things for the stairs? Where do they come from? There's the pipe from the stairs that runs along the stairs. Where did that go? And where does it come from? And here, as we go to the room divider, you can see how thick the walls truly are here. This is where the storage and the bottling of end stuff was separated. I mean, there's so much ventilation, but none of it really goes into the rooms where they're supposed to have done the work. There's one glass door, there's two smaller ones on the other side. There's none in here, so they could separate those rooms. The two corridors could be separated off. I don't think they did the same thing, and well, they must have done. These almost look more like offices. But, but, I wonder if this is not a Russian post-war, I don't know. Do you think this was original layout, these windows, or do you think this was post-war Russian re remodeling? It is, it is. During the war, these rooms were identical to the other ones on the other side. However, all this rebuilding was done by the Russians, as they had troops stationed there during maneuvers that had to be fed and housed. Little level room. Looks like some kitchen. It does? Or food. With the little staircases, with the little steps. Isn't that kind of weird? This little, little, these little steps there, what, what are they? What's that about? I don't know. But this is not original. No. Thing 
Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I just see something. There are those holes up there again. Oh, those blue two small holes below are for the cables. And those are the ones that's coming out of there. This post war technical tunnel. <laughs> well, well, here we're back to something that looks like the room next to us with the pipe running under the stairs. And, but there's no glass wall right here. I mean, there could, they, I guess this is, this is a Russian rebuild. It looks like that they're. Uh, Hello. I don't think there was. Well, it's hard to see when they ruined the door sills, I guess. It's a typical 70s alloy Yeah. Here could have been another blast door. There would have been two, two double doors into the. So that area is at least sealed off from everything, so it can just explode on its own like a little pipe bomb, just like there. You're gonna have to go show me. Was that for construction crane or was that one that was... I think for the generators. So that wasn't for the materials they were producing? No, I think for one man and then they sealed it. Oh, no. What the hell is that? No, this is that thing. Maybe some of your subscribers know this. It's almost Project Lisa type cables. This could have held a crane, and, but um, even if stuff came out here or came up here from below, you are still transporting an extremely volatile compound which has to be kept at a specific temperature in specific containers all the way up from a lift to put it on a train. Why store it on the bottom floor to begin with? I need ice cream so I can think. The cable's crawling through here.
I guess we go to the pool. Oh. The Siren plant is to the east of the large bunker. Here there's a large boiler house with long production halls and apparently also an underground port and tunnel. The Siren plant cost 60 million Eichmarks and planning began in early 1943 when the problems with Taboon production at the Dunford plant became obvious. And as Siren is easier to produce and six times more lethal, it was given top priority. So there would now be parallel constructions and productions at Falkenhagen Seewerk. Enstov was to be produced, and from the middle of 1944 it was. But we know very little about the Seren plant. After the war, the Russians apparently kept pigs in there. What took place out here is truly one of the most terrifying things of the Second World War, despite it never coming to fruition. And most of you here today are probably here today because your parents are here today, because your grandparents did not have to deal with what could have come out of here. All right, supporting pillars. This is the factory area itself I'm standing in. A little bit left over there. That would have been whatever kind of roof that would have been needed. Probably red bricks in between that have been removed. Probably. I mean, the pillars like this don't fall over just because the wind is blowing. And the building was built I don't know if it was destroyed, demolished, dismantled, but it certainly was here. And most people who walk in this area are not going to have the faintest clue that this place could very well, had the war lasted just a little longer, killed every single one of their grandparents. Mandatory technical tunnel. According to the book Chemistry of Death, Saren was produced here and shipped to Lüneburg, as well as the machines which produced it. I assume this is a reference to the facility near Münster. But any claims of this have also certainly been countered and denied. But it does make a difference if the half a ton was produced, something everybody agrees on, or several tons Again, if so, where did it go? The taboon we know where it went, and I'll tell you about that later. As I'm looking at this, I now see what the roof would have been of these flat cement slabs, few of which are hanging over my head. That's oh, comforting. Well, at least I know what the roof was made of. I wonder if the sides were the same. Hmm. So the technical was built. underground factory they had the plan they knew what they were going to do the scientists just needed one more year 
before they were ready. The method was somewhat defined, but the details had not yet been worked out. And these little hooks on this? Why are little hooks on this? That's very strange. All right. The more I look into this, I wonder if I will find that some of the scientists were deliberately stalling the process. This will not be here very much longer. Just a technical passage that runs through this wall. And this sort of resembles platform. Interesting. The layout would be really interesting to see. So there runs a little technical tunnel through this. Perhaps with a, an opening over here. Nope, an opening over there. There's a vertical opening there that the Techno Tunnel runs into, and then there's another there. I will be honest, say my field is mainly infantry. I don't exactly know what it takes to make poisonous gas, like shoving, so I can't exactly tell you, or even render an opinion where what will be and what it will take. Serin is relatively easy to produce. It is produced in several stages. The final before the end product is two relatively inert compounds, when which combined become serin. However, the half-life of serin when mixed is relatively short, unlike many other combat gases. So regardless how much the SS made of it, it is fairly safe to say that today, of any hidden anywhere, it is probably no longer a danger if found. I would quite frankly prefer to see a nuclear war, at least a tactical nuclear war, than the one fought with chemical gases. Taboon, saline, all these horrible things. To see what poisonous gas does to people, animals, living creatures. And Hitler knew that. That's why he wouldn't approve this project. Many things may be said of Adolf Hitler, but he was not a fool. He knew full well that if he used nerve gas first, the Allies would retaliate. Despite the fact that the German nerve gas Seren and Taboon was far more deadly than anything the Allies had. He had himself been temporarily blinded by gas attacks during World War I, 
and had no illusions as to how deadly an Allied attack would be countering on German cities. The Allies were bombing German cities far more than its industry. But he also knew that he had to have it, because they did have chemical weapons, so he too had to have it produced for the Reich. And indeed, in September 1943, a German air raid had bombed an American ship in the port of Bari in Italy, and struck one Liberty ship carrying 2,000 mustard gas bombs. It was hit causing the largest known poison gas cause of death during the Second World War, with over 1,000 men died, also civilians, as the military wanted to keep the presence of gas shells a secret. They did not tell the medical personnel what they were dealing with, fearing the Germans would take that and the presence of gas as a sign that the Allies were about to employ a deadly gas. It was purged from the British records on order of Churchill, and the truth was not revealed for another 20 years. And for the same reason, the OKH gave orders that the German combat gases not be blown up or put in a place where they might be hit by enemy action bombs or shells, as if a cloud of nerve gas was then be released, that would mistakenly be taken as a sign that the Germans had employed these. But as I told you in the previous episode, these orders could not always be adhered to, and train loads full of taboon went their way through German cities, and one was hit, and civilians lost their lives. Of course, the wrongful interpretation of Hitler's order to destroy these compounds could be mistakenly by some, meaning having them blown up, killing far more people. There was always a real danger of misunderstandings in war. And I'm very curious as to who actually did. Himmler must have known. Himmler must have approved this. He's the only one. And there were projects There are projects that Himmler somewhat approved, that Hitler wouldn't have. And him and his aide Grobman spoke of what they could tell Bormann about certain things that he couldn't find out, because then he would tell Hitler, and he wouldn't have approved of certain things and projects. It's just an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought to think in the chemical game of World War II, where Churchill, drunken, wanted to bomb German cities with poisonous gas. The SS wanted to develop poisonous gas and spread them over a 130 kilometer wide gap between Germany and Russia. That the sane one in the room is Adolf Hitler, who said no, no chemical weapons, no chemical gases. He knew what this meant from World War I. It's just an interesting thought to say, interesting thing to say that here, he was a smart one. Goes to show you, Nothing is black and white, and there's a little tunnel running into this. But this would have been a technical, a technical tunnel that runs in here into the underground. It would take a bit of work to get into that. And certainly it's empty. But, as any other factory, there's a sub floors and underground where equipment, pipes, cables, what have you, would run. You can see the debris from the buildings that's lying around. I think these are the roof tiles. I wonder if this was actually deliberately demolished, blown up to some degree. So some of this debris is laying all the way out around in the forests. What the? 
This is truly one of the strangest things I've ever seen. This one that's broken apart. See the rebar inside? See how thick it is? These are everywhere. <laughs> okay, don't stand on the broken one, you moron. See all these little lines of turtles? That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Of this entire place, this is the strangest thing. How these little stone turtles have anything to do with the production of sarin gas. <laughs> okay. All right, I've seen this now too. I, <laughs> I am confused, but we'll go with it. And now that my future self can tell my old self what they are, they are pipe connection covers. Yes, that's what they are, the little turtles. These large towering structures of the power plant where the electricity for this entire complex was made and behind me is the Serin plant. This is very large for a water reservoir. Yeah. But It's just amazing that they built all this. Yeah, it's in it's just construction. Middle of nowhere. This is a very rudimentary construction too. Look at the rebar just sticking out. This should have to be done. This didn't have to be pretty. This was the huge power plant here at Falkenhagen and the boiler house. It was the heart of the entire chemical plant and bunker. It supplied electricity and heat for the chemical plants and it was also absolutely necessary for the water supply pumps. The entire system required a lot of water from the wells and the lakes. It was constructed parallel to the sarin plant and it was one of the most modern of the time with coal dust turbines. Large power plant. This was for coal. It amazes me of the enormous amount of work, buildings, and the huge bunker they constructed here, with never more than 2,000 people on site working, and yet they accomplished all of this. One of the constant complaints here were that they were always shortened on deliveries of fuel, cement, steel, and materials, and also too few skilled laborers. Yet look at everything they did here. I can't help but to extrapolate this to what we are told 30,000 laborers did at the Project Riese, or S3. That leads me to think there must be more to those. Good Abend, you come here often? <laughs> Why do we always end up showing up in places filming each other? So there was three boilers, so the coal boilers, without the electricity, you know, nothing runs. It was said during the war, after the war, I think Speer told the Allies that if they had bombed, I think it was 10% or something of the German power plants instead of the cities. The war would have ended in 43 or 44, I can't remember what he said. But electricity, and logistics, and fuel is everything. Nothing runs without. And the Allies continued to bomb German cities and civilians instead. Initially, the story was because it's simply too hard to hit and pinpoint German industry and specific targets like a power plant. 
makes you wonder they probably didn't know there was a power plant here. Lots of debris out in the woods. So of course, IG Farben was here. BASF was here. DSS was here. Now, I know we Talk about war damage. Talk about war damage. This almost looks like a bomb hit, doesn't it? I mean, something brought this down somehow. I have seen a lot of bomb damage in my life, and that is exactly what that looks like, and I don't understand why or how. The Russians were absolutely prohibited from firing or bombing the facility, and the Germans did not demolish anything before they left. So what happened here, I do not understand, and I do hey. not know. This decay didn't just happen. This is not natural. These are not windows. The 
basement is open for business. Good pictures. Good pictures. No, good. It's a good sunlight down there. So this was laboratories where the scientists were working. The old scientists from the Navy, the Air Force, working here, Army, SS, Farben, BASF, others, on what they were doing here, which makes this an extremely interesting and complex place, given the money spent and the attention wrapped up in this location. This is one of the production halls of Saren, where several of the stages were to be completed. There are also a lab connected with the facility, and since there are so many buildings, it's a little hard to find your way around and identify which was which. is that the Russians used this as a pigsty. They kept pigs in here in the Cold War, which well, I guess if you can't find anything else to do with it, there was, there was lots of Russian soldiers stationed here. Pigs are good eaten. Does it make sense? Makes it incredibly hard to discern what took place here. A large factory hall. Uh, sloping sides up there. It could be a coal bunker, actually. I... Hmm, not entirely. I'm sure that it wasn't. Would make sense. Coal storage, what have you. This, however, looks like something that was built by the Russians. This was an original building that belonged to the Sarin plant. However, the Russians did put new windows in it as they repurposed many of these for their own. Be surprised. Full of water, very rusty cover. Looks like well. Could have been rebuilt. Where it's structured, it looks like it's a little bit of a compilation of different. Um, well, to be the well house. A large building this is.
it could have been there was buildings up here I don't think this was a flat roof there could have been wooden barracks hard to tell We're sort of walled in there's bare buildings everywhere here this is bricked in I think there was a rail running past here this was bricked in by the Russians or someone for the scientists there were poles so something was up here that was fenced in some rooftop something some strange reason I think there was a staircase from up here to down as well but I don't know if we'll ever know and now here once again the questions that kept coming to the forefront of my mind why was this bunker constructed for the production of end stuff? Nowhere ever at the time had any chemical factory been constructed this way, and there was no bombing danger in 1938. And why was it so important that the SS take over testing of end stuff? What is wrong with the testing done by the Army, the Luftwaffe, and the Navy? And that leads me back to Rolf Engel. Wilhelm Voss and the Kammlerstab, the SS Pioneer School in Stasovice and Emil Klein, and that one lone tanker truck which went to Prague, where all these men were located and working on extremely advanced and experimental weapons, rockets and nuclear testing. All things that were hidden after the war. And last week Tom reminded me of something. Emil Klein had stated after the war that they had a substance which could melt cement and stone. That way hiding places in nature would be impossible to find. And I remember one of the accidents of Enstuff that it melted through 30 centimeters of cement and 90 centimeters of gravel under that. That sounds a little bit like Enstuff to me. And again, I have to speculate a little here. As to what the Kammlerstab exactly were doing and how this might tie together in a different way. And then there's the other thing that irks me. If you look at the labor expenditure of the Project Riese sites, Hitler's Hauptquartiers, or the S3 in Jonasthal, you will find here were workers in the numbers of 25, 30,000, 35,000 and they barely managed to build much more than naked tunnels. How does that square up? In May 1944, only 562 prisoners were working at Falkenhagen, and they only came there when IG Farben took over. There was never more than 2,000 people total working on the construction site at Falkenhagen, and they managed to build one of the largest underground bunkers in the world, at least that we know of and put it into production. So clearly the Germans had the know-how and the ability to build great things with few labor numbers. So those numbers does not add up at the other locations. But in the back of my mind still, if the SS were handed the task of testing and stuff and everybody so desperately wanted it produced, I have to follow that single tanker truck that went to Prague. Let's take a look at what actually happened in Czechoslovakia during the Second World War. Because if anybody in the Reich would know what to do with a thing like Enstuff, despite nobody else wanting it, there's one research entity who might. The Kammlerstab. After the annexation of Czechoslovakia, the German Reich took over the largest heavy weapons producer in Europe, the Skoda Werke. Göring eventually would put SS Gruppe für Wilhelm Voss in charge of the Skoda Werke and of developing and manufacturing new weapon systems along with General Kammler, who would set up a joint research staff into the next generation weapon systems. And Kammler, Voss and Göring got along well. And Voss was also well liked by the Czech workers. 
Now parallel to this, under Sturmbannführer Rolf Engel, a special rocket research and test group was also established, at first setting base in Poland, but later moving to Przepram, Czechoslovakia. Engel was one of the first rocket pioneers, but did not get along with Dornberger. He and other top scientists were researching into remote control rockets, nuclear exploration, and alternative weapon systems, extremely advanced, and only under the control of the SS. And these were testing some of their new weapon systems. This was done in Czechoslovakia at the SS Übungsplatz in Stesovice, at the SS Pioneer School, which was run by Sturmbannführer Emil Klein, who towards the end of the war was tasked with creating secret hiding places for their research. And in 1945, the Kammlerstab, Rolf Engels' team and Emil Klein, along with Kammler's mine in Prague, Oberstgruppenführer Grosch, who was in charge of SS constructions there, were all in the same place. Voss was racing to the Skodavaga trying to save the secret files from falling in the hands of the approaching Russians. General Patton was racing there as well from the other side, from Linz, where he had just had Bergkristall handed over, intact, one day after Kamla left the area. Engel was scrambling to get out of Prague where the resistance was rising up. Thousands of members of the SS were rallying at the SS Pioneer School for one last stand, and it had to be right there. Kamla was last seen heading in that direction too. Patton made it to the Skodavaka, but the American officer in charge refused to take the truck full of German top secret plans. The truck Voss had been spending a week filling with all his secret research. He tried for days to impress upon the Americans to take it, but it all was handed over to the Russians. Voss made it to slip out quietly, trying to rescue his family, but he did not make it. They were all killed by Czech partisans, and he was arrested. Engel handed over something to Klein, who was later caught and tortured for 17 years in Czech prisons to reveal what he had hidden and where the secret SS plans were. He wrote long, detailed letters in code until he was finally released. Voss and Engel both ended up as international arms dealers, working as cutouts for the CIA and the German government. But if any other entity would have had a plan for Enstuff other than the melting of stone to cover hiding places of secrets, it was the Kammlerstaff and Rolf Engel. So what did they do with it all? And what was it? Historians are still digging holes in the mountains all throughout Czechoslovakia and around the Pioneer School looking. There are strange bunker complexes slowly being dug out from the sides of hills, but no permits from the government to get permission to look further are issued. Not to mention what was it that was so important in Stesovice that the Germans in 1944 finished the huge hydroelectric dam, which still runs here today? Millions of Reichmarks to build a dam in what was essentially an occupied country. What was this electricity for? It was claimed Prague, but no lines were ever laid there. The rumors persist that there's something hidden under the water passage. Also, the SS had searched and catalogued all the old mining tunnels in the area, and Klein had had his prisoners dig more, including secret hiding places. Some have been discovered full of documents later, but many more remains to be found. Also, I can't figure out what American unit made it all the way across the front line and Germany proper to 60 kilometers on the other side of Berlin in March or April in order to recover documents about Falkenhagen, as Gluber detailed after the war. I will stand by the fact that if any American unit came here, a deal with somebody high up had to have been made. The Alsos teams were busy still in the West at that time, and their report made no mention of this. 
Although, they did make it all the way to Oranienburg later, where they retrieved a lot of uranium before the Russians got there. But the Alsos teams were looking for nuclear projects. Why an interest in end stuff, if it was them? If not, I would wage the Zurich head of the OSS, the later head of the CIA, Alan Dulles, would at least be one to know. He was in contact with various members high up in the SS, and a frantic activity took place in Austria with masses of secret information moving that way through Ebensee, where Kamla was last seen. Schellenberg was moving the remains of Operation Bernard through here as well. And, for good measure, SS Obergruppenführer Krosch, Kamla's head of construction in Prague, was also last seen here, before he too disappeared from history, just like Kamla himself. This is bigger than Seren and Enstoff, but following the leads, everything points to a rendezvous with the Americans, arranged by Dulles or Donovan, high-ranking members of the SS. And such meetings were witnessed in small intersections of small towns not far from B9 Quartz, one of Kamla's huge tunnel factories near Melk. The Russians knew it, and they shelled such a rendezvous. The small town where Americans and SS men had met before the end of the war without exchanging fire. This document had been circulated for years. I am still not sure if it's real. To me, several markings and stamps seems absent. But I have no doubt that key players, such as the General, went to the Americans. And I am filing suit with the CIA to release the files they have admitted they still have under classification. It's been long enough, and we all need to know. And so does the families. That leaves us with the 612,000 shells filled with taboon and what happened to them, and the thousands of bombs filled with mustard gas. After the war, as the Allied had found tons of these musicians in the West, they came up with a brilliant, half-assed, measure, similar to what they did after the First World War. In Operation David Jones Locker, they placed all of these shells and bombs of nerve gas in the hulls of ships, and sailed them out into Kattegat, off the coast of Denmark, where they then sank them with explosives. Because to somebody that must have sounded like a brilliant idea. In fact, it was such a brilliant idea that in the 1960s, these munitions once again had to be painstakingly recovered by divers. Thereafter, they were encased in cement and having learned nothing at all, were sunk in an even deeper hole in the Pacific. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.